we thought this would be an ideal place to give you a tour of what we've done and what we're currently doing um, to restore the riparian forest habitat on site here. Um, currently, we are at the end of one of our old sites that we started in 2013 and has been closed uh, and just growing naturally for many years now and the beginning of a new site uh, for 2022. A uh, quick update uh, about the uh, Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge um, is that this it has had a lot of different types of land use throughout the years. Uh, behind us, this was all in agriculture um, until the um, uh, 90s uh, when the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge was created in 1992. Um, so these, year, these fields here were likely used for um, grazing and rice, and you can see a lot of the irrigation channels and kind of defunct infrastructure that date ba dates back into the early 1900s. Uh, behind us, we have our um, water way here. This is the Snodgrass Slough. Um, it connects to the Macaulay River and the um, Sacramento River. So it is a uh, warm water fish habitat. As you can see, most of it is covered up by water hyacinth. Um, the Stone Lakes staff are constantly managing the hyacinth, trying to keep it under control. But because water levels are so low this year, they can't actually access the areas to treat it. Um, but there are areas that have clear water, and that's where we get our water to irrigate our trees. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to start giving you a tour of our site. So we're going to walk down to our electric UTV. Um, you notice it doesn't have to start up. It runs completely off of batteries, um, and we, you know, use a renewable energy source to charge it um, at our office. So uh, it's really nice to have a quiet and earth-friendly um, mode of transportation out here. All right, let's head on down there. Everything look good on there? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Going on a ride. Let me Climb get, on in. Let me get a shot. <laughs> All right. Seat belts for safety. Any questions in the uh, Q&A yet? Not yet. Well, that's a perfect moment for me to do a little plug here. Um, this may come as an amazing fact to you, but the Sacramento Tree Foundation has been around for 40 years this week. This is our 40th Arbor Week. Um, we are currently trying to raise funds for some of our excellent programs. Um, if you're like what we do, um, or you continue to like what we do after hearing all the cool stuff uh, on site today, um, you can visit sactree.com slash Arbor Week to make a donation. Um, also, we have an Arbor Week festival being hosted at Urban Wood Rescue, um, and that's uh, March 13th from 1 to 5 p.m. So if you like what we do, come check us out, make a donation, or just come volunteer. So now we're going to start driving through the site that we are currently um, planting and preparing for planting. You can see a row of irrigation line and flags marking planting locations on our right. Um, those are yet to be planted. We're currently in one of those irrigation ditches that were previously used for uh, moving water around throughout this agricultural area. Uh, this big hill to our left is uh, part of the irrigation, the infrastructure to um, actually create the Snodgrass Slough. So um, it's important to just pay attention to all of these interesting land use and land history um, tidbits that are present on the site here. Just for anyone that's curious, we actually installed all of this cattle exclusion fencing ourselves. Um, and we'll stop at our brace here. Um, this brace was constructed using all urban wood rescued lumber. Uh, so it is, it is all uh, reclaimed from the Sacramento region and milled by our urban wood rescue program and then used to create our braces for our fence. I'm gonna have to 
pop out and move this PVC really quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna drive us to the top of the berm so we can get a good picture of the overall site and we'll head back down, down the lane. So now you can see that we planted um, many, many trees um, already this year. Um, most of the trees were planted this past Saturday during a volunteer event. We planted uh, 200 trees. Um, all of these trees are native. They're a mix of valley oak, blue oak, and interior live oak. Um, each one of them has been selected for an opportune site. So we don't put blue oaks down in the water and we don't put uh, the interior live oaks down in the water. Basically it's all riparian species down there. Um, and we are currently planting. So I want to give you a quick idea of what that looks like. We have some of our staff down there planting right now. Oh, we have our first question. Let's hear it. Is Stone Lakes open to the public? That is a great question. Um, there are parts of Stone Lakes that are open to the public, correct. Um, the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge headquarters, when you search on Google, it will take you to the uh, area that is open to the public. We are currently in an area that is closed to the public and really just has kept this way to uh, preserve some of the natural habitat. Here's Chow putting in a little seedling. It doesn't look like much, they're really small. Yeah, let's get a closer shot. I'm getting a shot. Don't mind me. All right. Right here we have a little valley oak seedling. You can see it's not very tall. This is the portion that's above ground and the rest is mostly root. Um, in the first year of their life, they and a couple years of their life, they put most of their effort into growing roots. Now I just want to show you a couple cool things. So here's our irrigation line and you can see our emitters where the water comes out. Um, these are pressure regulated and uh, only emit two gallons per hour. So it's a very accurate way to use a finite water source like we have here at, Sac at the refuge. We also have a bamboo stake and tube. These are really important. Um, I would say the main reason that we need them out here is protecting from voles. The majority of our mortality of our trees comes from voles eating the roots. Let's get a little zoom in of our awesome little friend here. So Chow, as you can see, is a master planter. We have beautiful soil here. Um, it's a mix of clay, but also lots of organic material from the years of farming that was here. Um, there, there's a lot of different types of soil here in the refuge, um, and this kind of silty loam is the best for planting trees. But just a couple feet away to our left, we have a very clay-rich soil down here at the bottom of the ditch and almost all the way to the top. So it's very variable, even within a couple feet of planting locations. Uh, we had one more question. Let's hear it. Do you want to talk about how you can get involved in volunteering and doing these projects? Yes, definitely. Um, the first thing to do is go check out sacktree.com. Um, we have a uh, get involved tab and you can uh, find volunteer events. There's actually a calendar. Um, the next volunteer event that will be planting these little seedlings is on April 9th in Elk Grove. So keep your eyes peeled for that event. Um, if you have any questions about how to get involved, you can email Justin at Sac Tree. He's our volunteer coordinator. Okay. All right, let's move on. Continue the tour. I have a feeling this is going to go a lot faster than that. Goodbye, I Chow. <laughs> Thanks, Chow. Bye, Chow. One other thing to note while we're stopped here tilt it down, um, is uh, these bales of straw. So we use uh, straw, which is essentially a waste product from uh, various different cereal industries. This, these bales are from wheat. Um, we prefer uh, straw mulch, but the wheat will do in a pinch. Um, and that helps to increase soil moisture and uh, build up the soil or soil's organic matter as it decomposes. Here I have another planter, Laria. Hi, Laria. Working on another tiny little seedling right on the base of the hill. Wow. Yep. Looks like you got a pretty sandy spot there, huh? Yep. So different. It's so different from one spot to the next here. Awesome. Could keep up the good work. And here we have Brooke putting the final touches on these trees over here, spreading some mulch to make sure that they retain the moisture that we put down. Howdy. Um, once we're done here today, we're gonna turn on our irrigation system and put water on all of these trees. 
Um, we're having an exceptionally dry uh, winter, so we're having to irrigate out of season. All right, we'll carry on. Um, most of our sites can be accessed by four-wheel drive trucks, so we've got our F-150 here. Uh, thanks to PG&E for donating this truck to us. Uh, they gave it to us last year, and uh, it's was it Tiger? Oops, sorry, Tiger from donating the truck to us. Um, we've had it for about a year now, and it's been a huge help. All right, so on we go through the site. You can see all the trees that we've already planted. The ones that still have the pot sitting on top were just planted by our staff this morning. Um, and the rest that we're about to pass by um, were planted on Saturday. And I gotta give it to the volunteers. They did an incredible job. Uh, the great majority of the trees were per planted really well and will definitely uh, grow to be old and tall. All right, so we're about halfway through the site now. Um, Wanna check out an owl box? Yeah, I think we should stop and check out a burrowing owl habitat. Right there. Perfect. This one isn't super... Mm. Let's go to the next one. I, I think it's a little bit more clear. So one of the species that have been affected by the massive changes in the landscape here are the bur California's burrowing owls. Um, they rely on the habitat of other species, namely um, uh, ground squirrels, to create their nests for them. Um, and when the, the landscape changed here and become, became more agriculture, it means it's really a better area for aerial predators to kill the squirrels. So the squirrels have not been very present on site um, and therefore there's very limited habitat for the owls. So the Stone Lakes uh, staff with Jewish Fish and Wildlife created these um, habitats for use by the burning owls. Burning owls require um, a, a habitat that has an entrance and an exit. And uh, this one looks like it's mostly being used by hornets, but uh, I have seen burrowing owls in, in these. Um, they usually kind of hang out and then they don't stick around for too long. They move from one to the other. There are, There is a habitat along this whole berm every 100 yards. So there's quite a few of them to choose from. All right, let's carry on and head down to the next fence. Any other wildlife we're seeing out here? Sure, um, yeah, we could maybe film the vultures up above here. Um, these are a staple, I, I hardly even notice them because they're here every single day. Um, they are really important. Um, one cool thing about a vulture is that they have the best sense of smell out of any animal on planet Earth. They have the largest olfactory glands, um, even dating back into the dinosaurs, um, similar to the T-Rex. Uh, also, on the fence post there, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it easily, but we have a kestrel, which is the smallest um, raptor that we have around here. They primarily eat other birds, and they love to perch on our fences and some of our intentional uh, perches that we install. You want to talk about uh, snow geese? Greater? Sure. Yeah, so let me just give you kind of an overview of all the different types of, uh, of birds that we get here. Uh, the one that really brings everybody attention is the Greater Sandhill Crane. Um, they are about four feet tall, they are extremely loud, and um, they come all the way from Siberia. So they, this is part of the Pacific Flyway. So this habitat is really essential for any migratory bird species. So the Greater Sandhill Crane is one. Um, the other really concerning species is uh, Great Blue Herons. This is the site of one of the few large remaining rookeries in the Sacramento Valley. So this habitat area, mostly to the north of us, is really essential for those, um, those cranes. Um, another, and herons, another mm -hmm. uh, couple different types of geese that we get here. Um, I, th I think it still works. Mm -hmm. Our snow geese, white fronted geese, uh, Canadian geese. Uh, um, those are the th I think three. those are the three big ones. Um, so we see all of those, and including lots of different grebes, ducks, uh, buffleheads, um, other shorebirds. There's really like, if you're a birder, come here during the Pacific Flyway um, and you'll see just tons of birds. Um, if you look off in this direction here, I, I doubt the camera is going to be able to see it very well, but there are some palm trees over there in the very distance, and that is the refuge headquarters. So we're quite a distance, quite a ways from there. 
Um, but that is the actual location that you can visit and there are walking paths um, that you can check out. Um, in addition, um, on the Stone Lakes National Wildlife uh, Rebs website, you can sign up for paddling tours and birding tours throughout the site. So if you're interested in visiting some of these close to the public areas, you'll have to sign up through U.S. Fish and Wildlife and attend one of their volunteer events. All right, let's carry on. We have aptly named this electric UTV the Power Ranger. It seems fitting. <laughs> All right, so we're getting to the end of what we're calling SP Cut 2022. Um, and we're gonna be going to another site uh, that we planted back in 2019 and 2020. Um, so we get to see some trees that have actually been growing for a couple of years, which I think will be really beneficial. Get it? Thank you. I'd love to uh, give another plug about Urban Wood Rescue Post because I just think this gate looks so good. Let's go take a video. So again, um, we try to use as many locally sourced materials, including where we get our acorns, where we get our tubes and our straw, everything. Uh, we try to get it as local as possible. So when we needed to build our fence and fencing fence, we wanted to use the most locally sourced wood we could possibly find. And lucky for us, we're connected with Sacramento Tree Foundation's Earth and Wood Rescue Program. So we got all of these eight by eight posts, the two by fours, everything was from urban wood. Um, these posts are 40 inches down into the ground um, and are quite secure and we created a little tension structure here to make sure that our fence stays tight over the years. Uh, but I just think it's really cool that we were able to use some redwood that was harvested from downtown Sacramento, you know, a dying tree that now has, has a new life um, growing other trees. So without these braces, our fence wouldn't be up. So that tree is uh, really doing a service to us. Quick question. Fire away. How many years are we going to care for these trees? Do you want to talk about the general? Yeah, that is timelines? a great question. So in general, um, when we are using county mitigation funding to plant these trees, we care for them for three years. So once we plant these trees, for the next three years, we will water them, prune them, mulch them, and replant them if necessary if they don't survive. So each one of these trees gets cared for for three years. Um, some of our other sites, we care for them for longer. It really depends on the needs of the site. Um, as you'll see soon, uh, just after two years, many of the trees are at a point where they don't really need our help anymore. And we can allow the, this forested area to kind of just naturalize. Um, so without further ado, let's go take a look at some uh, one and two year old trees to give you a perspective of how long it takes for them to grow. I'm loving that we're getting questions. Painting shot. So those of, for those of you that uh, are just joining us, my name is Lorna O'Rourke, uh, Restoration Program Manager at the Sacramento Tree Foundation. I'm here with uh, Colin and the Power Ranger, and we are um, exploring the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, looking at our projects, uh, past, uh, current, and past and current projects, and also just giving you a tour of an area where people don't generally get to go. So let's boogie on. If anyone is curious why these are called the Stone Lakes, um, it is because of the property owner into the 1800s was Rockwell Stone, part of the Stone family. Um, they were basically aristocrats in Sacramento in the early 1800s. And while we are getting established as a city, um, 
I don't believe we were the capital when, uh, when he was present here, but that's the reason that we have the Stone Lakes. Um, there are no stones anywhere around here, so it can be a little deceiving. Uh, the Stone Lakes are some of the, f the few remaining freshwater, natural freshwater lakes um, in the Central Valley. Um, and because of the loss of all those freshwater lakes, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has, just, has started to create artificial lakes because they found that those lakes were so integral um, to the abundance and, of habitat um, that they needed to be replaced. So now part of their management regime is to pump man-made lakes full of water uh, to allow nesting bird, uh, migratory birds to stop and eat and refresh themselves along the Pacific fly Flyway. Unfortunately, we're in a time of year when the trees don't have a lot of leaves. So don't see, be surprised if all you see is a little stick. Um, it will have leaves, it just doesn't yet. <laughs> We may get lucky and see a couple with leaves on them. I hope that those of you who are watching are able to appreciate how quiet our drive is. Um, coming from you know someone who's worked in the field for many, many years, um, and mostly riding on ATVs and tractors and all manner of loud power equipment, Having this completely silent off-road capable machine has been a game changer. When we crest the hill, you want to talk about what trees we're seeing up here? Sure. All right, before we go back down the hill, uh, let's get a look ahead here. Um, you can see that there's there's varying development of, tree, of leaves on these trees. Some are a lot faster than others. Um, and that really attests to uh, trees being individuals. So every one of these trees is a little bit different and they put their leaves out, they put their seeds out, usually at, a, at slightly different times. Now, right ahead of us here, these are mostly valley oaks, and then towards the back, there are cottonwoods. And they, it's deceiving, they look like they have leaves on them right now, but that is actually just mistletoe. Um, and mistletoe is mainly responsible for a lot of the decline in the cottonwoods here. Um, so every chance possible, we, we take cuttings from these cottonwoods and reproduce them so that they, we can continue to plant them on our reforestation sites here. Um, off to our right, you can see one big willow tree. Um, that's an arroyo willow. Um, it's really the full, most full-bodied of the willows in the Sacramento region. Um, it has, you know, a full tree shape instead of just kind of a hedge or thicket or a copse if you're a tree nerd like me. All right, down we go. So often, uh, often the distance behind us, you may have seen um, a bunch of cattle. And uh, that's because the majority of the Stone Lake's grassland habitat has to be grazed. And you wonder why does it have to be grazed? Well, if we didn't graze it, we would either have to mow it or burn it. Because the native grasses here, they do what's called thatching. Which means if they continue to grow and pile on top of their, themselves as they grow, they'll eventually create such a thick humus layer that their shoots can't get through anymore. So in a way, without fire or without grazing, these native grasses would completely terminate themselves. Now, cattle aren't the perfect management tool, but they do work as long as you keep them out of the reforestation sites. So that's why we have all these gates and fences. more fun than I expected. <laughs> okay, let's go for a little exploration. So some of these younger trees that you're seeing here were actually planted um, by acorns, no irrigation, anything like that. And they were planted in the uh, early 2000s by a um, oak enthusiast. Uh, they weren't with the Sacramento Tree Foundation, but they were still doing the good work of reforestation. Um, so what we're doing now is kind of filling in the gaps, filling in where their trees didn't succeed. Um, now this parcel has always been um, fenced off. So we 
are taking advantage of many of these already fenced parcels uh, to do our reforestation work. If it's not already fenced, then we have to install it. So up ahead of us, you'll start seeing a sea of green and white tubes. The white ones are just older and they're being degraded by the sun. Uh, the tubes that we use, they just, they fairly quickly break down in the sun um, and just turn into kind of dust. Um, it is microplastics and that is unfortunate, but the benefit it has to the tree's survival um, makes it worth it. Well, we've got our kestrel buzzing us over there. That is my favorite bird. Um, they are extremely fast um, and they have really pretty coloration. So those are the two things I like about them. So off to our right here, the trees to our immediate right were planted in uh, 2020. And then the trees ahead here, there are 760 of them, um, kind of starting here and heading out there. These were all planted in 2019. So let's go find a couple good examples of trees so that you can see. So we've still got some water on site. You can see that our irrigation line was moved by the flood water. Um, you'd be surprised how flexible PVC is. So here's a couple of nice, nice looking little trees here. I mean, you. Yep, that's a good looking tree. Um, that tree is, you know, not even three years old yet. Or 2020 was when we planted these. 2021 was the other one. So this is a two-year-old tree, um, and it's, you know, it's roughly four feet tall. It's got a good single leader. This tree, um, you know, if it continues to grow at this rate, will be quite sizable in just a couple years. Uh, there's another one off to your left there, Colin, that uh, has some more branches. tuning in yeah so lots and lots of these are doing really well um, yeah, every basically every one of these tubes has a tree in it now some of them are getting some of them are big and some of them are small and just remember trees are individuals some will be big some will be small it all depends uh, there's an especially good looking one over here let's go walk over there um, so we have some questions about the general area sure let's hear them does the whole area become inundated with flooding um, it really depends. So that big rainstorm that we got early in the year, I believe it was in October, this was all underwater. Um, but in pre previous years, I haven't seen the site go underwater. So it really depends um, on, on what the rain event is like and how much water we have in the water table. Um, though we do take that into consideration. So if you look off to uh, the side here, you'll see this standing water and this depression that runs through the middle of the site. Um, and that was probably a creek at some point. Um, so we planted only riparian species near and next to this depression so that if they are inundated, it doesn't negatively affect the trees. Cool. Got another question or? Is... Nope. Uh, yeah. More volunteers who have been here before. Oh, that's Join. so cool. You get to see your babies. Wow, look what you've done. Yeah, here's a good one. This one um, is doing especially well. And uh, I think the reason that it's kept its leaves all winter long is that it's just got everything it needs. There's no, no reason to drop them. Um, you know, all these leaves are still alive. Uh, so this is another, like you can see, and I'm six foot tall. So this guy's just about five feet. Um, and they will continue to grow at a rapid rate as long as they have good deep soil and water. Um, so another note about water, we know that we're only gonna be here for three years. So the time that we are here is really important. One of the things that we always like to consider is that these trees aren't gonna get regular water during the summer throughout their whole lives. So it's really important that we teach the trees to look for water themselves. The way that we do that is that year one, we'll water them every week. Year two, we start to taper it off and increase the length of time in between the cycles. Um, during an irrigation cycle, they'll always get the same amount of water. So year two, they're going to get 12 gallons every other week. And then year three, we do it 12 gallons every three weeks. So the benefit is that the tree's roots, they're still getting water, but they're having to look further and further and further away for that water. And that's because there's that longer dry out period in between the irrigation cycles. Now, that's just a general idea. It really depends on soil type. If we're planting in a really sandy soil, we'll irrigate.
irrigate more often the first year to get the roots established. Um, if we're planting in a clay rich soil, we will usually affect the soil moisture before we even turn the irrigation system on because oftentimes it stays saturated for far longer. What kind of soil do we have out here? So I would say this is a sandy loam um, with patches of clay. So it really depends um, very, very much on where you're digging and how deep you dig. If we, uh, this spot has almost exclusively sandy loam, it's about a foot and a half deep. So I, almost every one of these trees was being planted into primo soil. Now towards the far end of the site where you see that it's all piled up, that's the side of the snodgrass slough, they dug all that soil out of the base of the slough, meaning that it's got a lot of those deeper soils, which are part of the, the clay rich soil um, that makes up our hard pan here in the valley, which is part of what makes it a floodplain here. Okay, we have full functionality. Onward. What time is it? Can't see? We're halfway through. So I think we'll make it to the end. All right, we'll take a right past this little fella and then start working our way to where we started planting some more riparian species. Uh, we found that this site worked really well for the box elders. Um, they, they can be finicky and difficult to establish. Um, so it's really cool to see a site where that particular tree does very well um, <laughs> because you don't see them often. Um, they're they're uh, the Central Valley's only maple species and they're one of the few maple species that has a compound leaf. So let's go find a good example of one. I see a couple here to the left that we can show everybody what the box elder looks like. Here's another really healthy valley oak right here. Sturdy, you can see he doesn't want to fall over for anything. All right, we got a couple box elders here. Right here, look at that. Sturdy, nice and girthy at the base. This is gonna be a very happy box elder and it's actually starting to branch out. So sometimes if they get a lot of water year one, year two, they'll be kind of leggy like this. You can see the growth rate in between these is quite large um, but it's starting to shorten down as as the uh, tree gets a little bit more established so it's going to grow denser better quality wood um, there's another even bigger one off to the side here and that's impressive look at that that's over six feet tall two years old so i think it's very cool that uh you know these riparian species are getting established we put them um, kind of at the base of this berm on the inside edge. Um, over here we have more cottonwoods and willows that are right along the edge. Um, they're doing okay, but they're definitely not doing as well as these box elders. So I'm really proud of this guy. Keep up the good work. Want to talk about uh, voles and coyotes? Sure. So um, some sites are better and worse for voles. Um, I think that it has mostly to do with how many birds of prey are there in the area and how many coyotes are there in the area because those are the two species that keep the voles in check. Now the voles, they have a couple things that they really like. They like tall grass so that they can't be viewed by the predators when they're moving around and they like roots. So if they're in an area where there's no rooting material for them to eat, they're going to go for our trees. Um, they mostly eat the, the baby trees, their cambium. They'll basically strip the tree's bark all the way up and uh, stop it from being able to deliver water um, throughout the body of the tree. Um, we have found that the biggest thing that's gonna help voles is constant mowing. So during the vole season, we will make sure that these grasses are kept low so that the voles are running scared. Um, here we do have some already existing trees that are good perches for raptors um, or birds of prey. If we don't have any on site, will install something that can be used as a perch to encourage those um, predatory bird species to come here and help us with our pest problem. I had one more question. Sure. Um, do you want to talk about how we get water to hit the trees? You want to go over the pump system? Sure. Why don't we just go right over to the pump? Take a little walk over there. 
So all of our irrigation systems are run out here using a, a natural existing surface water um, source. So we have this slough off to the side here. We can get a little closer so everyone can see. And the, the water looks gross to us, but truly it's full of nutrients. That's why everything is growing so readily here. So it's probably pretty darn good for the trees. Uh, we haven't had an issue whatsoever with uh, putting this type of water on trees. Um, we just saw a big splash. That was likely a carp. There are a ton of carp and smallmouth bass in here, though this part of the slough is not open for fishing. All right, let's go to the pump site. So when I say pump site, I mean a Honda GX120 um, <laughs> trash pump. So these pumps, they can move a lot of junky, dirty water without getting damaged. They're a centri centripetal pump. Uh, pump. And so we use those in addition to a filter. Um, we use a disc filter um, to make sure that the water is clean heading into our site. Actually, we just stumbled, stumbled over something interesting. So let's zoom in on this really quick. Here's one of the other issues that we have. These are tooth marks. Um, oftentimes coyote pups or otters will come and chew on our polyethylene tube. I don't think they mean anything by it. Um, sometimes I think they're just smart and they know that there's water inside the tube. Um, but uh, yeah, this is something that we're constantly having to repair um, from the wildlife damaging our tubes. Maybe they think it's a snake. I'm not sure. They're teething. Yeah, they're teething pups. Could be anything. All right, so we do have a pump down there, don't we, right now? Uh, we have a pump to the other side, but it's the same setup. Perfect. So I think we can just stop at the fence here. No need to go to the other side. Oh, here's a nice, happy little arroyo willow. Got some good leaves going. Here's another one. Cool, let's see if we can just get this pump in the background here. So basically what we have here is an intake line that we throw down into the water. I like this particular spot because it's a little more flat and closer down to the water. These pumps can't pull, wa pull water vertically very well they can push water vertically very well so as long as your pumps pretty close to the bottom of the hill it should be able to push water up to the top now uh, that pump is basically secured to a stake there so it can't run away from us and we pull water through there and filter it before sending it into our PVC mainline that you can see at our feet here now this PVC mainline runs along the top of this berm and then all the way down to the far end of the site there so we have multiple hundreds of feet of, of PVC um, where water is moving through. Now, this pump can put out 160 gallons per minute. So that means it can water a whole lot of trees. I, I don't remember exactly how many off the top of my head. But essentially, we can turn on that pump and all of these trees get watered simultaneously. So uh, that's just one pump doing the job. Now we're gonna use a second pump to water these and these other 300 trees here. weeds we have out here? Sure. Oh boy would I like to do that. Okay, let's just pull a couple. Um, the biggest one for, for us here has been fennel. Um, fennel is uh, kind of hard to spot. People mix it up with yarrow, uh, but they smell very differently. So you'll know if you get some fennel. Um, do not confuse it with edible fennel. Um, it is not edible. So here we got this fennel here. Very fragrant. Um, it gets fairly tall. Um, and it can shade out the trees, so it is a bit of a problem. Um, I've found that if you just mow it, so it just, once it gets a little bigger than this, we just mow it, and it doesn't seem to be able to come back from that. Um, but that's the main one on the berm here. Now, down in here, one of the reasons that drew me to this site was that it's almost all grass. And you can see there's actually patches of different types of grass, including a bunch of natives. So. We don't have as many of these invasive species as we do on the berm here. I think it has something to do with the type of soil. Let's go find another one. I know there's a dark somewhere. Here's another type of uh, thistle. 
that is not a native thistle. Um, I believe this is bull thistle. I'm not totally sure. Um, it's kind of hard to tell for me without the flowers. Uh, I just know it's not good and we can't have it. Now there are a couple types of native thistles. I don't see them out here. So we don't really worry about it. If you see a thistle, if it's prickly, we kill it. On all of our sites across the board, especially here in Stone Lakes, we start off with a ton of th star thistle. This site had tons of star thistle, but all it took was two well-timed mowings, basically just cutting it as far down as we can with our trailer mower, and it hasn't really come back. Now you see, there are some kind of ones that are sticking around, but it hasn't been too much of an issue. Um, another one that we see on occasion is bristly ox tongue. Um, but you can see that this one has been cut down so many times that it's just really stunted. It's putting out these crappy seed pods. They're not really managing to reproduce very effectively here. So that's another one. I think that apart from, we've got milk thistle as well. I can play one of those in just a moment. They're getting harder and harder to find out here, so that's a good thing. are just starting to flower so this is a good time to cut it down um, just a reminder that anytime you're cutting a weed down cut it when it has three to five percent of its flowers blooming the reason that you do that is because it's taken all of the nutrients that were stored down here in its roots and it's put it up into these flowers so the roots are very depleted so if you cut the plant down there's not a lot of um, carbohydrates and energy stored in those roots to reproduce the upper plant the last one would be milk thistle. If you can't find one, we'll see it somewhere else. Any other questions pop up while nope. I was gabbing? Uh, this, is, this is worth noting. Um, so these are wild oats. Um, they've been in California for hundreds of years. They first came over with the Spanish. Um, this is really the species that gives us our golden hills, um, but it is not a native species. So these wild oats, um, you know, they, they don't really cause a lot of problems for us, um, but they are not a non-native species. I would much rather have that on site than just about any other invasive species. And I just happened to find a milk thistle here. Let me pull this fella up. Come on. Okay, got our milk thistle. Bless you. Thank you. Um, the reason they call it milk thistle is because when you break it, usually it kind of secretes this white uh, white sap. I don't think this one is quite ripe enough for that. It is used medicinally, but it's prickly, it spreads very quickly, and it can become a huge problem on a site. I think that's just about the last of what we're dealing with out here. Really not too big of a deal. We've had worse. <laughs> Look, you got so many wires hanging off of you right now. All right, so we're gonna carry on and kind of drive, give you a little bit more of a tour through this site. Um, check out some of the other stuff we got going on. Uh, one of the cool things that we've been able to do on this site, and, and we won't really notice it until uh, until the spring, but we have been fostering a milkweed uh, community here. So any area that we see milkweed. We will, instead of just mowing it, we will go and use brush cutters to target the invasives. That way we can keep the milkweed on site. And since we've come out here, um, we've been able to see it kind of in, start improving. For anyone who didn't know, uh, the milkweed is the only thing that monarch caterpillars will, will eat 
Um, it is essential for them be cre to be create their toxic chemicals that stop other animals from eating them. It all comes from the milkweed. So those, those, uh, that plant and that insect are bound um, to each other. All right, so you can see uh, this flooded area to the left here, and we can get a little shot of this. Uh, this has all been flooded. Um, it's looking a lot better uh, than it did. We had to come out and straighten some tubes and we still got some work to move our irrigation lines back around. Um, they do float, so anytime that they fill, anytime that there's water, they kind of wander around, but uh, really the damage isn't too bad. We have, a, we have about a month maybe before we really got to start irrigating, maybe a month and a half um, before we need to start water running water out here. Um, you know, soil moisture, just on testing it, you know, with my hand, is, is still pretty good. Um, so we're not too concerned about that at this moment. All right, let's cross into the, the second phase of planting here. I'll just kind of take a circuitous route through. Um, I decided to experiment with a couple interior live oaks um, in this area. Uh, I wasn't sure how they would like the soil, the soils here, um, but you don't see any interior live oak here in the refuge. And uh, you know, I think it, it may just because it was a better quality wood, better wood for burning. Um, most of the trees here that that uh, you know would have naturally been here were all cut down for firewood. So uh, that's part of the reason that there's no trees here and the reason that we're doing this work. All right, here's our interior level patch here. We've got quite a few healthy looking fellows. We can just do a little drive by. We've got one interior live oak. Happy little fella. And there's a couple more around us here. Um, they're actually doing quite well. Out of all the trees, they are the weirdest teenagers. They grow so awkwardly. They can't, they don't know what, what's up and what's down and they grow side to side instead of up and kind of just testing out the world. Maybe like a, a teenage son or daughter you might have. They're, they're just a little awkward looking. But over time, if left to their own devices, they become a normal functioning tree in society. All right, so we're heading through another kind of uh, existing uh, habitat here. And I wanna find a good example of this where uh, you can see that there are very different types of grasses. So it's off to the right here would be great. Um, you can see that there's there's two, two or three major types of grasses that are growing back in this woodland area. Um, and around the base of the tree, there is usually a little stand of native grass that's managed to uh, stay. So around this one to our right, we've got salt grass, which is a native, um, and a couple others. Grasses are not my forte, but uh, it's always good taking a look at them. All right, so we have named this site the, uh, the, the peninsula. And the reason is that uh, during the winter, it's, it's surrounded by water on, on three sides. Um, this site had the best soil out of any site on the refuge. Um, it was absolutely perfect. Uh, every one of these trees, these were planted just in 2020. And, uh, was it 2021? No, 2021. Um, and they are all alive. And some of them, even after just just one year, here's a good example of a couple right here. They're already four feet tall. So it just goes to show that soil depth is the biggest influencer on oak tree growth. All right, let's go show them where we get our water from on this site. Let's see how we're doing on time. 10 minutes. A lot longer than I thought. 
so glad we got some questions. That really helped me. We got to show them the cattle skull that's growing uh, on the tree. Let's go check that out. We got something really weird and kind of macabre to show you here. Um, this might be by accident, but I kind of doubt it. But here we have a cattle skull that a tree has grown through. Now I think that's pretty cool. Uh, it's probably, you know, this tree I would say is between, you know, 10 to 15 years old. So it's been doing this for quite some time. Who knows what happened? Um, another thing to note is the flooding. You can see that the water rose up over the banks here and deposited all this hyacinth up on the banks. Um, so that's just a good kind of image of how high the water got out here. Uh, I wanna also take them over to check out this Osage orange tree. Um, just an ornamental tree uh, that would, would be planted commonly at homesteads here in the Sacramento Valley. Um, it has a beautiful yellow colored wood. And this particular individual, or this, these two individuals here, are some of the biggest that I've ever seen. So I believe that these were planted you know, by a settler or, or a property owner that was staying out here at some point. Um, this is a very big Osage orange tree, um, and they put a lot of fruit out every year. They are not a native species, and they do propagate. So, so the oranges float. So the worst thing about it being here is that they end up in the slough and all over the place. So you see them on the sides of the slough. Um, I hope they're not coming from this tree because I would hate to see it go. But it is an impressive tree. Um, there's also a very large cottonwood there behind it that I think is worth noting too. So when I'm going through these forests, I always look for really exceptional individual trees like this cottonwood. So cottonwood is one of the natives that we plant. Um, and this particular tree is just, it's massive. Um, and I believe that if we were to harvest material from this tree and, and reproduce it um, and propagate it, then we would hopefully end up with another gargantuan tree in one of our sites. Um, long after I'm gone. Which is one of the funny things about planting trees is that we know that we're doing work that really won't come to fruition until long after we're gone. So it's, we know that it's important, we know that it's hard, and it's sometimes hard to have that perspective of why we're doing this because it's not gonna be something that we really get to reap the benefits of. Um, but we're all working towards a better planet and this is one of the things that we can do to um, make a difference. So if you want to make a difference with us, come and plant trees, make a donation. Um, this is our 40th anniversary. We've been doing this incredible work for 40 years all over the Sacramento region. Um, if you like what we do and want to make a donation, check out sactree.com slash Arbor Week um, or come to our Arbor Fest on March 13th from 1 to 5 p.m. at Urban Wood Rescue. Uh, if you have any, want any more info on any of these events or what we do or how to get involved, check out sacktree.com or just follow our Instagram. All right, well, we can uh, finish our little uh, tour out at the end of the site. Let's head. So if you're just tuning in, um, my name is Lorna O'Rourke and I'm here with Colin um, Fagan at the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we are just giving everybody a tour and talking about some of the reforestation efforts that the Sacramento Tree Foundation does in this area. Um, if you'd like to, if you're miss, missed out and you'd like to see the whole uh, stream, we'll, we'll be posting on our social media, including our Facebook. So to stay tuned if you missed out. Um, and if you have any questions about today or want to find out more about the Tree Foundation, check out our website. Um, and we've got lots of really interesting tidbits of information that, um, that we'd be loving, love to share with you all. 
All right, let's keep driving. That's the fun part, right? Something tells me we're gonna be doing this more. So down. Beautiful day, beautiful baby trees. Things are starting to turn green. Well, I think this is as good a place as any to pull over and kind of uh, wrap everything up here. Uh, let me find a shady spot for us. Alright everybody, well we've been doing this for an hour, it seemed like it went by so fast. Um, I just wanted to close by thanking everybody for uh, visiting our Instagram today and checking out this uh, awesome Q&A tour of one of our restoration sites. Uh, we'll be doing this more, so stay tuned. Um, we've got lots of sites all over Sacramento that are very similar to this, which are kind of secret little places that, uh, that are hidden um, that we get to go plant trees. Uh, if you want to come plant trees with us, we would love to have you. Um, the next event that uh, we'll be planting these little seedlings, like the one you've been seeing today, is on April 9th in Elk Grove. So if you're interested, uh, sign up online at sacktree.com. Um, if you have some spare time this Sunday, the 13th, come check out the Urban Wood Rescue Yard. We're having a festival we'll, uh, from 1 to 5. We're going to have Chondo's Tacos. We're going to have lots of fun and games for kids and families. We're going to be selling urban lumber. Um, and really, you can come and ask us questions about everything that we did today. And we'll even have the Power Ranger there for you to see. Wow. So, uh, yeah, come check us out at Urban Wood Rescue, um, Sunday from 1 to 5. And uh, if we don't see you there, hopefully you visit our website or uh, check out.